Good evening, friends. It's the Wednesday Night Bible Study, 7 p.m., and I'm glad you could join with us. A couple of changes tonight. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the camera's going to be higher because last week I was told that I kept pounding the table and, and shaking the uh, camera. So uh, we're going to keep the camera safe and, of course, not interfere with the live stream. But if you're joining with us tonight, thank you for doing so. I'm also wearing my suit jacket. Uh, earlier today, I uh, was able to record Casey, God bless him, uh, Casey Way, uh, record a chapel sermon message for tomorrow for the International Theological Seminary. That will be posted on our YouTube link, and you're certainly welcome to go and join um, in to uh, see it, or go into the link to see the sermon for tomorrow, April 2nd. It'll be on the Palm Sunday ride of Jesus into Jerusalem. But here's the deal. Though I may preach on the Palm Sunday uh, for tomorrow's chapel at International Theological Seminary. This Sunday, Casey Way, Pastor Casey Way, is going to be giving the um, message on this Palm Sunday. And I'm excited to hear what he has to say. I hope you are too. Come and join with us again, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, uh, for live streaming the service. It is Palm Sunday. That means this next week is called Holy Week. Uh, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and then some events occur during the week, as you know leading up to the Last Supper and the cross uh, on Friday, Good Friday, and then, of course, Easter Sunday. And as we all know, we're going to be live streaming through all of this. We are, it's important that all of us are social distancing ourselves. Again, we want to make sure not social isolating from one another, but social distancing um, to keep ourselves safe and everybody else safe so we don't carry the virus to them. And so but please join with us Sundays at 10 a.m. and uh, Pastor's Bible is at 7 uh, as you're doing tonight. Next week's going to be a little bit different. Next Wednesday, we are going to do the pastor's Bible study. In fact, we're going to look at Jesus on the cross, John 19, uh, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. But then uh, Thursday night, we're going to do a Monday Thursday service, live stream, of course. We're going to have communion. And uh, interesting times because we can't come together to have communion, so we're going to be doing that live. Um, we encourage you to join with us, uh, get a piece of bread, uh, some juice, hopefully grape juice, if not any other juice will work, and we'll take communion together as one big family as we uh, have the Last Supper with Jesus. And then Good Friday service on the Friday. They're all at 7 p.m., so Wednesday, 7 p.m., Thursday, 7 p.m., and of course, Friday, 7 p.m., and then Easter Sunday, 10 a.m. So I think that's all the announcements I need to make about the scheduling. We just hope you can join with us. Last time we came together, we were praying for some people. Uh, George Monty, I tried to call him today, just want to make sure he's doing okay. As I mentioned last week, we were concerned about his, you know, he, he had his uh, stomach removed uh, a year and a half ago and has been having struggles with that. Uh, we want to pray the cancer doesn't come back. He was in good spirits when I talked to him last week, but uh, we haven't connected this week. Keep praying for George. Also, Nikki Rodas, our um, communications coordinator at the church. She went in for surgery, as you know, and we're praying for her. And uh, just keep her and her family, Al, and uh, uh, the boys in your prayers as well. And then also, uh, we do want to pray for Kat Sims Guerrero. Still pray for her and her family as they recover from many things. Um, looks like they're doing better. Kat uh, had, had an illness that took her to the hospital after having surgery the week before. And uh, so it looks like she's doing better. And then, of course, uh, we prayed for my father. And I want to say thank you for that. He had a fall uh, the week before and um, hurt himself. He's doing much better. And so I just want to say thank you for uh, joining with me in prayer for him. I am sure there are many other prayers that we should be covering tonight. Uh, we're going to pray in just a moment as we start the Bible study. But if you have a prayer request or anything you'd like to, um, you know, you can reach us here at the church, but also even tonight, type in the comments. And if you type in the comments, we'll begin praying for those. And if you have any questions or anything, you can type in the comments. The master KC Way is actually right across the room uh, hey, doing hey, all hey, the hey. media. So, you said it again? I said, hey, friends. So anyway, it's good to have him because I, I certainly might have a clue on how to do all this. Uh, so thank you again, KC. Uh, come in here and preach Sunday. Uh, well, actually, don't come. Just go, go on the computer <laughs> and hear him preach and we'll have worship again. All right, let's open with prayer, and God bless you for being here tonight as we join together reading the scriptures and uh, listening to God's word, uh, praying for the Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts and minds. Would you bow with me in prayer? Almighty God, we thank you that we have an opportunity to come together as your people, as the church, 
as people who want to come and worship you. And we pray that we would worship you tonight, Lord. Though we may be reading the word, we thank you that this is an opportunity for us to hear your word, to believe it, and then to live it out in courage as your Holy Spirit directs us. Jesus, we thank you especially as we come toward Holy Week, as we thank you all the time, but especially this time that you had the courage to go to the cross. There upon the cross, taking the sins of the world, our sins, past, present, future, upon yourself, so that we would be freed from sins and alive to all that is good. We thank you, Lord, that we are no longer victims, but we are victors because Jesus, after finishing the work on the cross of bringing us one with God at one minute, you rose from the dead and uh, show us what we are going to be one day and that we will be made in your image as your Holy Spirit blesses us. Bless each person that's here joining us with us tonight, Lord. They have needs, they have concerns. We pray for those people we mentioned, for George and Kat, for uh, Nikki, for Roger. We pray for other requests too, God, and you know what they are. We pause for just a brief moment and ask you, Lord, to hear our prayer. And God, I want to thank you for everyone here tonight. I pray for their needs, that you would meet their needs according to your riches. And God, bless them in the body, soul, mind, and spirit. Bring them wholeness, shalom, peace, we pray. We pray all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight what we're going to do is look at a couple of chapters. Uh, and again, if we had more time, we'd be going through word-for-word -word study um, from John. We started on 14, 15, of course. We looked last week. We saw the word meno uh, in the Greek, which means to abide, to remain. Jesus says, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Uh, meno is used again and again, um, abiding in Jesus. It also sets the context for answered prayer, I think, because Jesus tells us seven times in two chapters, you have not because you ask not. Ask anything. The Father would be glorified. Ask, ask, ask. Seven times. That's a, that's a lot of times. When the Bible repeats something, it's, it's, it's its way of underlining. When it's three times in a text, you, it behooves you to listen. But when it's seven times, I mean, this is kind of the point. Jesus is saying, you have not because you ask, ask. And of course, the context is, if you abide in me. And that's what we looked at last week with Jesus being the vine, we being the branches, the source, uh, the power flowing through him through into us as the Spirit. The same Spirit that lives in him lives within us. The same Spirit that raised him from the dead now lives within us by faith. And so we looked at that last week. Tonight we're going to take a look uh, uh, briefly at John 16 uh, because Jesus tells them that they will suffer. And he's, as he gets them ready for him going to the cross, they still have no idea. They, they don't have a clue what's happening. Um, he's the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Anointed One. Um, Christos is the Greek word we use. Mashiach, Christos, same word. One's Hebrew, one's Greek, means the anointed one. And so I think they kind of believe that Jesus, because he raised the dead, cast out demons, walked on the water, that he would go into, into Jerusalem and have victory, as many other people believe. But instead, I don't think anyone really understood the way of the cross. Jesus was clear about the way of the cross. But for some reason, nobody really caught on to it, except perhaps for the woman who anointed Jesus' feet as she as she prepares him for the burial. You remember we talked about that a couple weeks ago. But as Jesus goes to the cross, then his disciples, um, he, he tells them that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon them and the power that they'll have. But then he tells them that their grief will turn into joy, that they will grieve because he's gone. They don't know what to do. They're going to scatter like sheep um, at the crucifixion. And, and yet they will, they will have joy. But he reminds them in chapter 16, as he will in 17, we'll see it in his high priestly prayer, that they are not of the world, but of the kingdom of heaven. And it's interesting, they are in the world, but not of the world. And I just think that phrase is important for us to unpack here for a moment. Because we, through faith in Christ, are in the world, but we're not of the world. Because of Jesus, we know that there's another home for us. This is not our home. Jesus kept telling us, don't put your treasures here on earth, but put them in heaven. And so he kept reminding us to move forward, that, that we're coming to the fullness of the kingdom of God, though he ushered it in and brought it with him. And so, but he reminded them that they're not of the world, they're different. And I think it's very interesting, and I think it's important for us to look at that before we look at John 17 and see the unity that we have 
that the word for church in the Greek is ekkaleo, out called, called out of, ekklesia. Ekklesia in the Greek means you're called out to live differently. You're called out to belong to Jesus, to live differently than the world does. In fact, in the Romance languages, that word ekkaleo, ekkaleo, um, iglesia, you may have heard that, iglesia, that, that comes from the same word, to be called out. And that's important for us to know, that we are here in this world to enjoy God's blessings, family, friends, but this is not our resting place. This is the place that we're journeying through, and we're going to the eternal city to come. And so we are called out of the world to live differently. Jesus reminds them that they are um, called out of the world in John 16, and and at the end of the chapter, Jesus exclaims that they finally believe. And uh, he's excited about that. He says, in the world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world, Jesus said. How important that is for us. Jesus has overcome the world. When we see in the New Testament, it talks about those who overcome will be granted to sit upon the throne. Remember that in the book of Revelation? We wonder, what does it mean to overcome? Well, it's the one who believes, as 1 John tells us, the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God has already overcome. And so our faith and trust in Jesus makes us overcomers too. And I think that's important for us to know. So let's jump into John 17. That was the quickest I've ever talked about John 16 in my life. But I'm trying to move us through so we catch up on the schedule to, uh, to see Jesus going to the cross next week. Jesus makes a prayer. and It's called the High Priestly Prayer. Uh, kohanim is the word for in Hebrew for priest, the kohanim. Um, and Jesus is the great Kohanim. He is the high priest. Uh, we know this. Much The scriptures say much about this. We find Jesus in his prayer in John 17, the great priestly prayer. Then he'll go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. But there at the Last Supper with his disciples, he has a prayer. Uh, oh, by the way, and this I think is very important too. Uh, and we'll look at this again next week as we come to Monday, Thursday, the last meal that Jesus has with his disciples. Uh, the word that is used in Luke's gospel for the, the upper room where Jesus has the, the, the meal is kataluma in the Greek, which is only used one other time in the New Testament. It's at the beginning of Luke's gospel. And I think it's important. There are many words in Greek for the word in. You know, you go to an inn, the Good Samaritan takes someone to an inn. But the word kataluma is used at the end of Luke's gospel, at the beginning of Luke's gospel. You might remember there's no place in, uh, for Jesus, for his family at the inn. Remember the Christmas story? No place for him at the inn, the kataluma. And one more time it's used at the very end of his life as he has a meal with his disciples and invites us all to come. In fact, that's the whole Bible is about coming to the meal. The spirit and the bride say come. Remember the, we looked at that a couple weeks ago. The invitation is to us to come to feast with Jesus. But uh, there at the upper room, the last supper is at the kataluma. In other words, because at the beginning of Luke's gospel, there's no room for Jesus at the inn, he spends his life to make an inn for us all to come. Have you received that invitation? Tonight it's given to you. Receive it and come. Come, uh, eat with Jesus. This prayer that he makes before they go out to the Garden of the Seminary is threefold. He prays for himself, for his disciples, and then I want you to note this, he prays for you and for me. Father, the time has come. This is verses 1 through 5, John 17. The time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. It's a beautiful prayer. That's Jesus' prayer for himself. Did you notice how much of that prayer? Here he is going to the cross. Here he's going to suffer an excruciating death, excruxus, out of the cross, pain. And as he goes to the cross, what's on his mind is to bring glory to his Father. That's the prayer he has for himself. I, I want you to know how short it is for himself. He, he prays that he would go. Now he's going to go to the garden and pray, Father, take this cup from me. But um, I just, in, in the high priestly prayer, Jesus spends... Uh, so little time for himself and so much for his disciples and for you and me. But notice that Jesus wants to glorify his father. And that's his hope. And then he goes on to pray for his disciples. Um, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. Back to Jesus again, verses 1 through 5. Most of us spend time in prayer for ourselves and ourselves alone. 
Oh God, help me through this thing. And we should be praying for those. Oh God, help me get over this burden in my life. Oh God, heal me. Oh God. And that should be, but friends, mature prayer is, is begins to grow into something else. No longer do we just pray for ourselves. We begin praying more so for other people. You know, I just think it's beautiful that, that Jesus teaches us to get out of ourselves and to be praying for the world. And it's through service to others and praying for others where we begin to understand healing for ourselves. You know, it's easy to become in our spiritual life very self-centered, but that's immature. Jesus wants to mature us and make us whole, and we begin praying for others. Praise for his disciples. He has given them his words. Jesus comes from the Father. He's going to the Father. And so in John 17, verses 6 through Eight, uh, 19, he prays for them. And you'll note this when you read it later. He's given him, them his words, and then he prays to his father that the father would keep them safe. He loves his disciples. He loves them all. The shock of it all is that he even loves Judas, Iscariot. He loves him. Um, at the garden, remember when Judas comes, has betrayed him, and betrayed him with a kiss. Jesus says to him, friend, why have you come? Jesus loves his disciples, even if one will betray him, another will deny him, Peter, three times. But notice he prays that they would be protected because they won't fit on the earth. And he ends by praying with them to say, they belong to the kingdom of heaven, so sanctify them. That means set them apart. Build them into something that, that, that's different. Sanctify them. Make them holy. Make them different. Different than the world. We're going to come back to this in a moment. Because as he prays for us in verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays that we too would be sanctified, but that we would become one, even as he and the Father are one. Let me read this to you. My prayer is not for them alone, verse 20 of 17. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you, just as. I don't know if you caught that. Not like or similar to, but just as. Jesus wants us to be one with him and the Father. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given to me to be where I am. To see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you. Though the world does not know you, I know you and know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself be in them. I don't know if you caught that prayer, but look at the beautiful thing. He's praying for you and for me. This happened A.D. 33. That's 2,000 years ago almost. And he's praying for you and for me. And he's praying specifically that we'll be one. I have to say that I think the greatest challenge of our society and our life right now is not to be one, the divisions that are caused. I even said this a while ago to someone. I said, you know, all right, I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm almost 55. <laughs> Here's my secret. You'll figure it out. If you're looking at Facebook, it'll tell you my day. But I'm almost 55. And never in my lifetime have I seen such anger and hostility uh, that people have to one another. There's hatred in our society. There's division. And I just think this is because of this, now we as the church have this wonderful opportunity to share about the unity and love we have for one another. Someone mentioned the term yesterday, and I saw it, and I, I love the term. No, I, don't, I didn't love the term, but I love, I, I like the term to explain what's happened in our society. This person said, we live in an age of a critical spirit, a critical spirit. I happen to believe this is exactly what's happening in church. It's time for us to not live in that critical spirit. What, what disheartens me as a pastor is how many times I see people who claim Christianity and claim to be followers of Jesus, but they're quick to point out, oh, I hate that person, that person's evil, that's bad. You know, I learned a lesson when I was young, and maybe you learned it too, um, where, where when you point at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at you. Sometimes we get angry at people because we see the same sin in them that we struggle with. And yet we have to learn to get out of this critical spirit or we're, gonna, we're not going to make it. And we have a chance to be powerful in this world, to show them what the love of Jesus looks like. Yeah, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, doesn't matter. We love one another first. And it has to stop because we're killing ourselves. We're killing and dividing each other. And we're killing ourselves too. I love the ancient story. It's about an old sage. I'm going to tell it to you. It's, it's one of my favorite stories. 
It's about a, a, a wise old sage who lived in a village long ago. And one day he was standing by the gates of his city, which means he was one of the leaders of the city. And a traveler came by and said, hey, old man, I would like to know, how are the people in this city? I have to leave my city. I don't, and, and I'm looking for a new place to live. What are the kind of people are here? What are the types? And the wise old man said, well, before I tell you that, tell me this. What were the people like from the city in which you came? The man said, oh, they were horrible. Not one of them. None of them were good. Not one of them was good. Evil, terrible, backbiting, slanderers. The wise old sage turned to the man and said, well, I'm, I'm afraid you'll find the people here the same way. A few days later, the wise old sage was outside the city and and um, another man came by and, and asked him the same question. Hey, excuse me, wise man, but how are the people of the city? I have to leave my city and I'm looking for a new city to belong to. And the wise old sage says, well, tell me, what did you know about the people from the city in which you came? The man said, oh, they're the most beautiful people. They were loving. They were like family to me. I, I, I'm sad that I have to leave them, but because they're such beautiful, beautiful, good people. And the wise old sage said about his city, you, my friend, will find the people in the city the same way. Now, it's a beautiful image because I think it explains the moral of the story is you're going to find what you're looking for. In our critical spirit, the age of a critical spirit, you're going to find what you're looking for. If you want to find hypocrisy in people, you're going to find it. If you want to find evil in people, you're going to find it. If you want to find good in people, you're going to find that too. So I just hope that the church takes this moment to learn of even... The man Barnabas, do you remember him? Son of encouragement. His name was Joseph. He was a priest, but he became Barnabas, but the son of encouragement. We need people in the church to be sons of encouragement who don't divide, but who bring together. Friends, if Jesus prayed before he died that we would be one, then it's a scandal that we're not one. And it's a scandal that we could dare criticize and slander each other. That makes no sense at all. God, help us. Help us to be the people that are beautiful and loving, who look past divisions to look for the, the, the way in which we're the same. We belong to the kingdom of God. We're in the world. We're not of it. I think it's important that we show the world what the kingdom of heaven looks like. It's love. All right, we come to chapter 18. I'm looking at my time here. Oh, there's so much I want to say, but uh, chapter 18, what we look at is Gina, Jesus finished his prayer, then took his disciples across the Kidron Valley in, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, through a valley up to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, you, you know that place. You've heard it before. It's, Gethsemane actually is Aramaic, and it means the uh, oil press. And I think that's very significant because it was a place Jesus loved to go to to pray. His disciples knew that. Judas, who has now gone to betray Jesus, will know exactly where to find Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Jesus loved to hang out and pray. And as they, he came to the Garden of Gethsemane, again, oil press, I think is very significant because... Now we see the image of the Son of God, and almost like the Garden of Eden again. Here he's being pressed. He's pressed so much in prayer. Sweats, he sweats blood from his forehead. He's pressed. And uh, it's just a very, if you think of that in that term, then you know the anguish of Jesus as he's in the garden. Listen to the words, John 18. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples, crossed the Kidron Valley, on the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas, Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing that all was going to happen to him, isn't that amazing? He knew. He knew the scriptures. He knew the prophecies. Um, he went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, he drew back and fell, they drew back and fell to the ground. Pause there for a moment with me. Because the scene is a very horrible scene. It's the darkness of night. Jesus is the light of the world. Notice, we'll look at this next week as he's as he dies upon the cross in the middle of the day, the earth grows dark because the light of the world is snuffed out. Notice when he came into the world, the light shines with heavens and the angels singing because in the middle of the night, because he is the light of the world. And he snuffed out, but now it's darkness. And they come to him with their torches and lanterns and weapons. And they want Jesus. And he says these words, but in the Greek it says, Ego eimi, I am. Now we have the reflexive, I am he. 
because that helps us understand um, what he's, he's admitting to, being Jesus of Nazareth. But the word I am, ego e me, from the Greek is translated from the Hebrew Yahweh. We saw earlier in John 8 that Jesus called himself Yahweh and they wanted to kill him for blaspheming because they couldn't believe that he's the one, the voice of the burning bush, coming from the burning bush. But Jesus is proclaiming that. I am, he says, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. That's why they fell to the ground. Because he used the name of God revealed to Moses, Yahweh. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. There's the good shepherd. He loves his disciples. He loves his sheep. If you want me, fine, but let them go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I've not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, Malchus in Hebrew could mean belonging to the king, Malchi, uh, Malchus, but he's the servant of the high priest, and um, he cuts it off. We have to wonder, what is he doing with a sword? Well, if you look at Luke 19, no, Luke 22, if you look at Luke 22, Jesus has a dialogue with them about uh, swords and what, how they, things are going to change for them. And, Peter's out there, and I think this probably confused Peter. Is he brought his sword. Times had changed. Now Jesus says to him, Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And according to Luke's gospel, Jesus picks up the ear and puts it back on Malchus and heals it. I don't know about you, but if I saw Jesus take an ear off the ground and heal him, and I were one of the guards, maybe it would give me some pause, wouldn't it you? The only explanation I have for why they continued on is because the darkness had come and this, this, this rolling of evil now, wanting to get rid of Jesus, and they were caught up in that spirit. And we all know how darkness has a power to it, and uh, we see that throughout the Bible, how the darkness rolls and people roll with it. Jesus says, stop. But now this is truly a dark moment. They, Jesus heals the ear, and yet they still take him, come after him. Then the detachment of soldiers with his commander and the Jewish official, officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Pause for a moment. What do we know about Annas? Now, before we did the live streaming in our Bible study, we actually looked at Annas. And we saw that Annas was a very wicked man. Josephus, the Jewish historian in the Antiquities of the Jews, describes um, Annas. And Annas is the Kohanim. He's the high priest. But when his term is over, he puts his son in, into the high priest. When his term is over, he puts his next son in. In fact, he puts in five of his six sons into the high priesthood uh, position. It's, it's nepotism at its worst. And then we see that once he's done with the five sons, there's another one. But uh, he puts in Caiaphas, who is his son-in-law. In other words, Annas is the puppet master. He is controlling all of this to make it even more shocking. And we looked at this a couple weeks ago. Annas is the guy who owns the business of buying and selling the sheep and the, the animals in the court of the Gentiles. Remember when Jesus throws the, chain, the money changers out? And the, Annas, that's his business. He is a wealthy, perhaps the wealthiest man in Israel. He's making it off of the name of God. And we find Jesus, once he overturns the tables, we can no doubt say, aha, Jesus isn't going to get out of Jerusalem without being crucified. Annas will make sure of that. Notice that he's not the high priest, but they take him to Annas' house first. We see many trials. We see him going before the Annas, then the Sanhedrin, the Caiaphas. We'll see him going to Pontius Pilate, who sends him to Herod, then back to Pontius Pilate. All within the span of a night. It's just a terrible, obscene thing that, that nobody knows quite what to do with them, but they all want rid of him. And Jesus goes from one place to the next. Now, here's an important moment. Um, Simon Peter and the other disciple who were following Jesus. Because this disciple was not known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You're not one of the disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold. The servants and officials stood around a fire. They had made to keep warm. Now, actually, what it says is around a charcoal fire to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them warming himself. I want you to note that it's a charcoal fire for this reason. 
Because that night, Peter will deny Jesus, you know how many times, three times, just as Jesus told him he would. Notice that there's a moment at the end of John's gospel, beautiful and tender moment where Jesus is on the seaside. And Peter, after he has been just racked with guilt for denying Jesus, and now he's okay with Jesus because Jesus is risen from the dead, but he's not quite fixed yet. Jesus then takes Peter aside, but notice on the seaside, Jesus makes a fire out of charcoal. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were on the seaside, I'd probably make a fire out of driftwood and cook fish. He makes it out of charcoal fire. That's, that's pretty explicit. And I think Jesus is taking Peter back to the night when he warmed his hands over the charcoal fire because Jesus is going to rebuild that moment so nothing gets swept under the carpet. Isn't that beautiful about Jesus? We can be okay with Jesus. We can know we're forgiven. Jesus is on a, a, a journey to make sure we're not just okay. He's going to make us experience total forgiveness. Right, let me pause here this moment and say that maybe in your life, there's something that you feel that, that has set you aside from Jesus. That, that you know he loves you and you know he forgives you, but you don't quite feel right with him. Jesus loves you so much, he's coming after you. And he might replay the scene where you did something that you felt bad so that you can go back to that moment and learn what true forgiveness is about. When we see on the seaside um, that Jesus, as he, he talks to Peter after the charcoal fire takes him out, and he says to him three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Notice he doesn't say, hey, Peter, you denied me three times. How could you? That's what I would do. How could you do this? How could you betray me? I told you, we're gonna, what's wrong with you? That's how I would have rebuked Peter, not Jesus. Jesus asks him simply, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter then is now restored because of the love of Jesus. How, how many times in my life I expect the rebuke of God and instead I hear the mercy and grace of God? How many times I hear Jesus say, all right, Ross, you blew it. I took care of it. Let's get out. We can do this again. Let's move forward. And instead of hearing a harsh word from God or Jesus, it's his kindness that leads me to repentance. Maybe tonight you need to know what that repentance is or that kindness of God, that Jesus is not ready to blast you, but he's ready to restore you. He wants to bring you one with God. Remember we looked at the cross beam, that pulling us up to God on the cross, pulling us to each other, the unity that we have, God and others all brought together on the cross there. Friends, that's why we can't have a critical spirit. That's why we can't be slandering people or saying things behind their back. We're, we're called to love people because they've been made in the image of God. And God wants us, Jesus wants us to be one, even as he, just as he and the Father are one. That's the beautiful image of that cross. All right, Peter has denied him. Let's finish this up. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've openly spoken to the world, Jesus said. He replied, I've always taught in synagogues at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. That is true. One of the things about Jesus is he's transparent. He is the epitome of transparency. We talk and throw that word around all the time. Oh, you gotta be transparent, you gotta be transparent. Jesus is the one who's transparent. And he teaches us not to hide things. He teaches us not to do things in secret, but to live it before the world. This is who we are. That's authenticity. That's, that's, that's the beauty of authenticity. That's what it means to be um, whole. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said, he said. When Jesus had said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what was wrong. What is wrong? But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now see, Annas is done with him. Send him to his son-in-law. Okay, now the high priest can... This Annas had no right to be interviewing Jesus. But he did. Because some people just do what they want to do. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he, asked, he was asked, You're not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I'm not! One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear... Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Now, 
it gets even more specific. Not only do we have the rooster crowing, as Jesus said, the rooster will crow three times, he'll deny him. But we find in another one of the Gospels, at that very moment, as Peter denied him the third time, Jesus was led by him, and they looked at each other. I, I, I believe that's why Peter lived in hell, if you will, a, a certain hell, after Jesus was crucified. And even though he was risen from the dead, he still wasn't okay. That's why Jesus had to come after him again. The love of Jesus is relentless. It's, it, it comes and pursues us constantly. I hope you know that. Now, we're going to end there tonight. Because next week, we're going we're gonna to look at uh, Pontius Pilate. We need to understand Pontius Pilate's story. We need to see who he was, that he was afraid of no one. The very fact that he hesitates having Jesus crucified tells us a lot. We're going to look at Bar Abbas, son of the father. That's his name. And contrast that with Jesus, the real son of the father. Then we're going to look at the cross and, and see how Jesus was put upon the cross and what that means for us. Even as he cried out, it is finished. What's finished? Religament has taken place. Religion at one minute with God and each other. So, friends, I'm going to offer a prayer right now, and we'll call it a night, and come back next Wednesday to look at Jesus upon the cross. There's just so much here, so much that is, that is, that, that is explaining who Jesus is and what he did and why he's the king of the universe, and he is, and how he is um, the one who has saved us from our sins. And made us whole. And friends, tonight as we end, I just want to ask the question again. You are, not a, 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 you are not a victim. You are a victor. Do you feel that way? Do you know that way? Because if you feel powerless, if you feel like there's some burden in your life, let Jesus take it away from you. Let him restore you to God. That you would feel that good conscience, that good experience of being forgiven and then being set free. So let me offer a prayer for you. Oh God, as we end tonight in the words that we've looked at in John 16 and 17, we thank you in 18, we, we thank you that Jesus, you have prayed for us. And every one of your prayers comes true. So we know the words are going to come true, but we pray that Lord, we wouldn't wait one day to become one with each other. But even today, even tonight, we dedicate ourselves to stop the slandering, to not live in the critical spirit, but to show the world what the kingdom of God looks like. It's love. It's loving one another. It's being encouraging to one another. Even though we may have our differences, Jesus, you died to make us one. So may we be one, even just as you and the Father are one. Thank you for our time together tonight. Bless us as we go our way that we would be a blessing to you and to the world in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.